Happy Monday and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Rocketeer Minute, where each and every day, Monday through Friday, we go over one minute of the greatest adventure movie Walt Disney's ever made, the 1991 Joe Johnson-directed feature, The Rocketeer. I'm one of your hosts, Jim O'Kane of TVDads.com. And I'm Hal Bryan, an airplane nerd from the Experimental Aircraft Association here in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. So Jim, here we are in minute 56. Yeah, we're on the second half of the movie. I'm just, I'm trying to grapple with that, that we're actually on the downhill side now and it's... That's really hard to believe. Yeah. If, if the movie were 112 minutes long, we'd be at the halfway point, but it's not. It's what, 108? Yeah. So this this is the week, though, that we're starting the, the downhill week. Right. So uh, It's all downhill from here, it's folks. It's all downhill. So keep <laughs> listening, <laughs> please. <laughs> we're on the back nine. Yes. But actually, we're still in the Bulldog Cafe where both PV and uh, Cliff have decided to turn in the rock. Well, I think Cl- PV's actually decided to turn over the uh, the, the X3 Cirrus uh, to the feds a long time ago. He's just right. finally convinced. It took the death of poor Otis Bigelow to convince dear, dear old uh, Cl- uh, Clifford to, <laughs> to turn it right. into the rightful owners. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, PV was on, uh, on board with that from the beginning because yeah. of the whole borrowing without telling somebody being also called stealing. Yeah, just oh. kind of a, a tragedy. Anyway, he's, he's going to do the right thing so right. we watch uh malcolm sneaks out the front door or he doesn't sneak out he just kind of wanders out and cliff's gonna go make that call i don't know if I, right. you know and it's cliff it, comes it, out of the head of the dog and pv follows him that's right yes yeah. <laughs> right down his uh, i guess his spine so right. so clifford's gonna make the call i didn't notice any you know I've, and i've scrubbed through several minutes of this movie and i do not yes. notice a phone book i mean they have that message board but there doesn't seem to be a phone book anywhere near the telephone ah that's interesting all the numbers are just written down aren't yeah. they yeah so did he we we don't see what what's happening when he's making the call he he uh, it's going on while malcolm crosses the street and two of the the those two familiar uh, buick roadmasters that we've uh, We've seen previously driven by Eddie's boys, right? Uh, coming up, we, we never really talked about the Roadmaster though. Those are those are brand new at the time, nineteen thirty eight Buicks. Yeah, they are. And uh, we were talking uh, just a bit uh, offline before we started recording. You know that Roadmaster series has been. You know, it was around in the uh, in the. Th- 30s through the late 50s and then again what in the late 80s uh yeah mid mid 90s mid 80s i had a i didn't own one but i had a hankering for one i used to drive a little ford escort and had (laughs) you know little kids and stuff like that and i didn't want to have a minivan but i kept looking at these buick roadmasters they were they were at the time the largest uh passenger vehicles that weren't you know like (laughs) <laughs> like like Econoline buses. Just to give you an idea of the size, from the front bumper of the Buick to the front of the radiator, it was 36 inches. That's how deep the thing was. It was just enormous. They were absolutely you know, huge cars. So the, the 38 model we're talking about, uh, I'm going to have to do some math here real quick, but like the wheelbase itself was 133 inches. Wow. So that's more than 10 feet in the wheelbase. If you can picture, this is maybe an odd frame of reference for people, but if you can picture the classic uh, four-door, you know, sort of wagon version Land Rover, the Doctari Safari out in the bush kind of Land Rover, the longest version, the long version of those, not the longest version, but the long version of the traditional Land Rover was uh, had a 109-inch wheelbase. So this is another two feet longer than a, than a big proto SUV. Uh, so that's the wheelbase. Then the length was 213 inches. So that is pushing. It's getting pretty close to 20 feet. It's not quite. That'd be 240 inches. Yeah, they're. Pretty, I mean, I know that Toyota Tundra has about 140. I want to say 45, 145 inches. Uh, so it's not. Yeah, I mean, this thing is this. It's basically it's a, it's it's like a Toyota Tundra only right. it's a car. Only a sedan, yeah, exactly. And in, in, in also offered, we see the hardtop here is also offered as a convertible. You know, weighs in at uh, fifty one hundred pounds, which is you know decent uh, decent size for a car. And I had uh, looked, I found out so in thirty eight, the new one went for sixteen hundred and forty five dollars, which today is is about twenty eight thousand five hundred or so. You know, not the most expensive new car around. Uh, by a long shot, but but sort of up there, uh, up there. It's, it's in the, Audi country, I'd guess. Yeah, this is not a this is not an economy car, and yeah. certainly sixteen hundred bucks at that time was a significant amount of money. Keep thinking of the uh, the B fifty two song about the Chrysler that's as big as a whale. Yeah, as big as a whale. 20. Yes, <laughs> that's pretty much yeah. it. This uh, this I think is as big as a blue whale, and probably seats at least twenty five. Yeah. But in this case, at least the, the convertible version almost looks bigger because it looks like you could just sort of pile more people into it. And it, it's funny, though, in this scene, you know, we know that this is what these cars are. I think it's just the angle and we're compressed a little bit. You know, they don't seem 
massive. They seem sort of normal sized cars that pull up and some gangsters pile out. Yeah. I mean, we saw, we saw them earlier during the, when they were racing off to follow the Rocketeer. In, right. Uh, because of our minute 46, 47 in there. You know, it was kind of like a Keystone Cops thing. There was a bunch of them hanging off the those uh, running boards sure and uh, which is something i've always wanted to do i always wanted to know what a riding on a running <laughs> board would be like and he's probably not, not very safe but i just it must be just like sitting on the outside of a boat these enormous except if you fall it hits harder yeah that's true right. that's true just imagine trying to you know like tow something like that it's got a weight close to a ton of uh of like the doors themselves were like refrigerators. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> As we arrive in on the inside of the the Bulldog Cafe, we see Millie pouring coffee. She's apparently pouring coffee for nobody. It's for somebody that isn't there. I mean, it's... Right, it's, it's between PV and uh, there's just like a big couple of empty stools. Yeah, so was she pouring one because after Cliff does his confessional to the FBI, he's going to come and sit down and have a cup of coffee and wait for his inevitable time in Alcatraz? <laughs> that could, could very well be. Yeah. Um, and uh, and of course Cliff is uh, you know at this point he's calling the FBI, Agent Morris answers, yeah. and uh, he's uh, uh, you know ready for Cliff to start start talking, but uh, Cliff knows something is up. Yeah, I was wondering why he would call the FBI directly, or wouldn't he call the uh, L.A. County so- someone? It just seems like well, I guess he was de- he had his dealings with the FBI. Yeah, that's true, and uh, I think he knows that this is bigger than uh, than local law enforcement. He's got to go straight to the feds. Yeah. It, I would imagine that either uh, Fitz or, or Wooly handed him a uh, card, some kind of a business card, before he waltzed. <laughs> yes, before he waltzed. But I don't think they'd have a general number, although they may have called the general number at the front, and they have a switchboard somewhere, just trying to figure out where Agent Morris came in. And I always wonder who, yeah. we don't have him listed in the credits, but I would love to know who Agent Morris is. I'm assuming it's either the editor or, of course, once again, it's probably Joe Johnston. Yeah, it could be Joe Johnston again. You know, might be Dave Stevens, but uh, it's probably Joe again. Sometime we will have to, uh, we'll have to ask Billy. Well, actually, Billy will probably be on later on. Uh, either this week or next week, so we can mark that down as a thing to ask Billy the next time. He's yeah, on. see if he knows, and see if anybody was. Uh, and, you know, we've talked to him before about uh, actors. Uh, you know, giving you lines from off camera, and uh, and and I wonder in a case of a phone call like this, would they have gone to that trouble, or would would uh, Johnston just have just have given him a line for the timing, or would have just said, "Look, just you know, say this." Wait a couple of beats and say this, then wait another beat and say that. Yeah, I would. I would think that there'd be a script supervisor at least that would be feeding him the lines so they could he could chat about it. Right. You know, his conversation doesn't really line up because suddenly he has to switch gears and and says, you know, I'll be home soon, honey. Yeah, he's really good at uh, assessing the situation quickly. I'm trying to remember if there was any. You know, us, uh, I was just going to say, Jim, us uh, us pilots, we're very highly trained. Uh, we have uh, we have almost superhuman uh, powers of observation and adaptability. I'm just going to put that out. Flying there. spider senses or something. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I was trying to remember if Clifford met any of those boys besides Lothar. I can't remember any time earlier. Other, I mean, he saw them from a distance when PV pointed out, oh, we've got company. But I don't think he's actually right. met any of Valentine's boys before. I don't think he has at this point in the film, no. Because, and if you think back, you know, they thought that the, uh, they thought that the gangsters chasing them were the the newspaper people. Yeah, that's true. You know, the whole you steer all push. It was it was right after, right before that. They said, oh, it's the you know it's the boys from the press that were chasing him. Yeah, and it was so, some guy, some yeah. other all they're looking for is Lady Luck's boyfriend. Right. Which uh, you know, who knows who knows if they'll find him soon. But he gives he gives the officer Morris a an overview of he's he'll be home soon, honey. And uh, and goes and sits down for the benefit of uh, Spanish Johnny and crew. I really want to go have some lamb stew. I keep looking at the <laughs> I keep looking at the, there's a sign there for lamb stew and it's rather pricey at 50 cents for a, for a bowl of soup in the 1930s. I would think right. that's kind of uh, up there. And you know, we found uh, I'm sure uh, Mike Bruno has one of these menus, uh, you know, in his collection, but I haven't had a chance to think to ask him. You know, we did find some pictures of uh, some of the screen used menus that show the interior of the Bulldog. It's, it's interesting to look and see what's uh, what was on the menu. So in the interior, you've got, I'll just describe this very quickly, uh, since uh, since this is apparently an audio only podcast. Uh, <laughs> there's no pictures. You, you can't see what I'm seeing. Uh, there's a nice uh, sketch of a Bulldog at the top. Dinners, it's choice of soup or salad, entree, potatoes, one vegetable, tea or coffee, and dessert and the first thing on the menu is braised veal chops and this was an interesting touch the price on the menu has been crossed out and has been uh, amended to be 95 cents and then you've got your old-fashioned beef stew for what looks like 85 cents ham hocks and lima beans for 75 and a few other sort of entrees like that and then there's a uh 
a, a little sort of warning that just says uh, uh, no short orders. Mm. So that was kind of interesting. And then in the section at the bottom from the fountain, you can get a, a chocolate malted milkshake for 25 cents, a regular milkshake for 20. Um, and then interesting to me in the same section, you've got ham and egg for 20 cents, bacon and egg for 20 cents. What do we have? Uh, fresh fruit orangeade for 10 cents, fresh fruit lemonade for 10 cents, and a lime. Boy, it looks like a lime Mickey, but that doesn't sound right. Who wouldn't like order a Mickey off the menu? That's something you get slipped. I can't quite read what that is. Very, very faint. But anyway, uh, certainly what what that is uh, actually that is actually a drink. Apparently. It is a lime Mickey. A lime Mickey. I can give okay. you the recipe right now. Thanks, <laughs> thanks to the internet. Thank you, internet. Well, first we uh, uh, we figured out earlier what went into a pink Weber. Now you're telling me we know what's in a lime Mickey. Yeah, a lime Mickey consists of uh, grape syrup, lemon lime soda, limes, ice, and straws. So you mix. You well, basically you mix uh, Seven Up and or, or Sprite is the <laughs> people don't remember Seven Up. Right. Uh, but you, uh, the Uncola. <laughs> yeah, the Uncola. Sp- uh, Sprite and grape syrup. Ugh. Oh, that just doesn't sound great. Yeah, it's great for your front teeth. It just yes, and it was only a, only a dime back in 38. Anyway, just amazing. I don't know, recall, I mean, I couldn't tell you without really just doing nothing but watching scenes and trying to count, but how many menus there are in this, uh, in the Bulldog. We never see that I can think of. We never get a readable look at the interior of one, but uh, the info's there, the detail's there, and it's all very plausible, especially, like I said, this little handwritten change to a price. How amazing is that? Yeah, and I'm just uh, for a diner. I'm really surprised that they have no short orders. You can't come in and order scrambled eggs. You can't come in and right. order you, a hamburger. Yeah, you can get ham and egg or bacon and egg, which they call from the fountain. Again, seems a little bit, uh, a little bit strange. But, uh, um, but yeah, isn't the very definition of a short order cook uh, the kind of person you would expect to be behind the counter at a place like the Bulldog? Yeah, you have to be able to sit down and rapidly prepare a meal. Now, right. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> you order and, a chicken and come back in 45 minutes and we'll have it ready yeah, for you. exactly. You order something at the front counter and then somebody yells back, Adam and Eve on a raft, wreck them. Yeah. And then... Uh, 86 on the Adam and Eve. Yeah. Exactly. And then you get uh, poached eggs on toast or whatever, yeah. whatever that is. These gentlemen do not take their hats off, I noticed, yet. But uh, I guess there's no place to hang... Well, there is a place to hang the hat, but yeah, I guess they're not, a, they're not expecting to be around that hat rack. And then who is that at... Uh, I will always, I always feel bad. I always get skeets and goose uh, mixed up at the far, okay. far end of the counter. Far end of the counter is goose. Okay, so goose is wearing his hat, goose, which seems goose cranks her up. That's the way you remember goose. Oh, goose cranks her up. Yeah, that's right. So that seems a little bit odd that he'd be wearing his hat inside, but uh, but then again, it's a it's a casual place. And then we, uh, you know, we also see. I was just going to say something else about the cover of the menu. There's a great slogan. It's uh, where the flyers meet to eat. Wow. So that's under the Bulldog logo. And again, I don't know that you ever get a good glimpse of that, but but there on the menus uh, throughout the any scenes inside the Bulldog. Meat to eat is a great phrase. There's a, I'll tell a brief diner story. <laughs> on the road between uh, Dallas and Austin on uh, Interstate 35, there used to be a great diner called the Elite Diner in just south of Waco, Texas. They had a gigantic neon sign that would, or it was a one of those digital signs back back before digital. It was just those light bulbs that would, you know, have a, oh, sure. a marquee going across it, and it would say "Elite Diner," and then it would say "Elite," then go out, eat, then go out here. <laughs> oh wow! Just it just is one of those road points, you know, ba- basic milestones of places, a monument on the way of you go. Okay, I'm halfway to Austin from Dallas. And eat, uh, elite eat here was the was the thing. So, uh, little side note that that diner has been it, it was it was out of business for about ten fifteen years ago, and uh, it's been closed. But it's actually being reopened as the Magnolia Diner, and oh. it's owned by uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines of uh, uh, Fixer Upper. Oh, fame. the Fixer Upper people. Yeah, I knew, I knew yeah, that name. Yeah, so they. And as soon as you mentioned those neon signs, I remember there's a few of those I remember in the San Francisco area as a kid, you know, where they would just sort of flash in sequence and you had to really watch and sort of read along with it. That in turn always makes me think of uh, a song from A Mighty Wind that uh, you had Harry Shearer and, and Chris Guest and Michael McKeon singing. And there's this the line, look for the busted neon sign that flashes E A. O's. Yes. And so the first letter is out, or the last letter, and then the J is out in Joe's, but E at O's. Uh, when, when I lived in Northern Virginia, uh, in Winchester, Virginia, there was a Shoney's, a Shoney's restaurant, and uh, their, their, sign, their sign always had half the letters out, and my kids growing up would always call the place Sneeze, because all it said was S N E Y S was the only things that were left. So let's go to Sneeze for breakfast. And there was a, there was a place I remember in, uh, 
the San Francisco area where I lived as a kid and it was, uh, and I'm probably, I may be mispronouncing it, but it was something like hammer slag or hammer slog. Hmm. And the sign, the neon sign, big neon sign was a forklift and the forklift was lifting up an H. And then when it got to the top, then the rest of the name would light up. And so as kids, you're driving down the, the freeway, anytime we were by there at night, the whole car full of kids, my two older brothers and I had to go, ha, ha, ha. Hammer slag and <laughs> and that was extremely entertaining to us. But, Kids, uh, you didn't know understand entertainment nowadays. Yeah, we exactly. Had a, we had but a we neon had, sign. We had a neon snow. sign that we drove by like you know once every several months, and we uh, liked it. The first sign I ever really read, there was a neon sign. Uh, my dad was a welder, boiler maker. Actually, he made he made boilers all around the New York and New Jersey area. And one of the ones that he worked on was he worked on the mash tons and the boilers in uh, the Budweiser Brewery in just outside of Newark Airport. I can remember driving past where my where my dad built the he built all the all the you know it's, it was like five years old or something like that. And the first sign I could ever really read because I knew how to spell it, <laughs> it would say Bud Bud Budweiser. And I just oh, jeez. Yeah, you know, thanks. before Sesame Street, kids, that's what we had. We right. had Budweiser signs. And Budweiser signs. Well, th- this is kind of a brief precursor here. This this particular episode is uh, beloved character actress Margot Martindale tells him he hasn't seen him, and who you know they're lo- they're looking for Cliff Secord, and uh, right. they haven't they haven't seen him. But as you said, it's a precursor. We're really setting up the tension for uh, for some things that are going to happen next. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's hold off on the mayhem until tomorrow. We'll, we'll check back on all these things and uh, lots more to talk about on, on tomorrow's episode. So let's do that. But uh, for folks who want to talk a little bit more about diners or famous neon signs that you grew up with and how you learned how to read. <laughs> <laughs> Family entertainment. Uh, check with us on social media. We've got a bunch of places you can do that at. Twitter, you can find us at Rocketeer Minute. On uh, Facebook, you can find us at Facebook.com slash Rocketeer Minute. You can find us at the big site, RocketeerMinute.com. We've got previous episodes you can listen in on and find out all the other things that we've been talking about beyond just neon signs and veal, uh, <laughs> veal, veal chops. But check back with us here tomorrow as things are going to start going sour at the Bulldog Cafe. We'll see you here tomorrow on the Rocketeer Minute. So until next time, over and out. <laughs>